All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Randy Ross, who is in a slightly cold Atlanta, Georgia today, right, Randy? It's colder than normal, let's say that. <laughs> Not nearly as cold as up north. Yeah, that's for sure. And just to make everyone feel better, I'm as usual here in San Diego and it's actually pouring with rain and it was thunder and lightning earlier, so... We do occasionally get a bit of not so great weather. Um, so uh, Randy's uh, is the founder and CEO of Remarkable. He's a CEO as in Chief Enthusiasm Officer. Um, he is a craftsman of culture and a catalyst coach who inspires elevated performance. And he's also an author and a speaker. But what we wanted to talk to Randy about today was the new book you have coming out on February the 5th, uh, which you can pre-order now on all your favorite uh, online bookstores, um, Relationomics, Business Powered by Relationships. So, um, Randy, g give me the, um, the genesis of, of this book and why you, why you wrote it. Well, sure. Um, it's interesting, John, if you, if you track the research that Gallup has put out over the last 20 years, really, on levels of employee engagement, then you know that it hasn't moved northward very much at all. As a matter of fact, even today, less than a third of the American workforce is what we would describe as fully engaged, meaning that they have a strong emotional attachment to the work experience. And so it's, it's, um, it, it's a conundrum, but it's also uh, disheartening to me to understand that the vast majority of people spend a lot of time every week, 40, 50, 60 hours doing something they don't enjoy. And uh, that's a travesty. And so really what our first book, Remarkable, is about, it's about corporate culture. And now this book is the follow-on book, Relationomics. Just this idea that people thrive and organizations flourish in relation, relationally rich environments. And so how can we help people create those types of environments that inspire people to bring their best to work every day? So so let's talk about that. When you say a relation, a relationally rich environment, that'd be an easy one to say after a few drinks. Um, if you what do you what do you mean by that? Uh, because. Uh, you know, relationships can obviously take on a lot of different forms. So what, what is a relationally rich environment? Well, relationally rich environment means that, that we have such a strong connection with the people that we are around and we enjoy being with them that we, we literally create a culture. And uh, culture is a fascinating thing. Sure. The culture is really how we play in the sandbox together. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just simplify it. And so even though you would think that principles and practices that lead to healthy relationships would be pretty much common sense, it amazes me as I travel the country how many organizations place so little emphasis upon cultivating healthy relationships. I mean, we, we spend a vast amount of our time and energy and resources investing in products, you know, research and development, manufacturing. We spend an inordinate amount of time talking about processes, especially of delivery and of service. And we, we talk about supply chain efficiencies, but we don't invest in the people element as much as we should and making sure that we get that people element right. You know, sometimes I'll speak at conferences and I'll, I'll ask people, how many in the room believe that your people are your greatest asset? And every hand in the room mm -hmm. goes up. And I say, then you'd be wrong. And everybody looks back at me like, what are you talking about? And I say, well, see if you agree with this. The right people are your greatest asset. Right. The wrong people are your greatest liability. Mm -hmm. Healthy people bring nourishment and allow organizations to flourish. Unhealthy people can be your biggest roadblocks. And so everything really revolves around people and how healthy those people are when they come to work in our environments. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's very true. I mean, I think we've all worked in, in, we've all seen it firsthand is, you know, when, when, you know, people are bringing their best, every, you know, the energy goes up. When some people aren't, the energy goes down. And sometimes when those people leave, the energy actually goes back up again. So, I mean, there is a, there is a big correlation there. Um, but you don't mean when you talk about this and relationships sometimes and culture sometimes nowadays people think well that means everybody has to be happy and smiling all the time but that's not what you're talking about at all right well no not necessarily although we do know that happy people do sure. better work 
But what we're talking about really is emotional health and well-being. Because if people are optimistic, then they're much likely, much more likely to be resilient, demonstrate perseverance, engage better with our client base, both internally and externally. And so when we talk about healthy relationships, really what we're talking about is how do we begin with ourselves? If you want to use the term emotional intelligence, you can. But how do we read and lead ourselves? And then how do we connect deeply with other people and read and lead them? I mean, we, we talk about um, a remarkable culture is a culture where three things are present. It's a place where people believe the best in one another. Therefore, they want the best for one another. And then lastly, they expect the best from one another. So it, so it all begins with trust. If you believe the best in one another, you're talking about a high trust atmosphere. Right. You know, where, where trust is high, resistance is low. And change and progress can come quickly. But where trust is low, then resistance is always high. And it's hard to get things moving. It's hard to build momentum because people question leadership. They doubt. They second guess. You know, when there's a vacuum in communication, they're likely to fill that with expecting the best rather than I mean, expecting the worst rather than believing the best. So a high trust environment is a place where people believe the best in one another. And then consequently, they want the best for one another. In other words, a deep sense of compassion and connection. And then and only then can we have the accountability, which is expecting the best from one another. Yeah. And, and let me just go back for a moment to something you touched on at the beginning there, which I think is a critical piece. And that's this whole self-awareness piece, because we, you know, we often, you know, it's a human nature is that we always expect everything from everybody else. Right. And we look at problems externally always. The hardest thing is to look internally first and become aware of who we are and how we how we operate and how we impact things so how do you how do you help people to look inwards first rather than always looking outwards yeah well we spent a great deal of time in the book talking about this but to to make it very succinct i think feedback is the breakfast of champions mm -hmm. and we as leaders or anyone for that matter we have to not only know how to receive feedback well. We spent a great deal of time talking about authenticity and transparency in the book, but we have to not only receive feedback, but we must aggressively seek feedback. In other words, those organizations that we work with, the, the most effective are the ones who've been able to successfully create open loops of continuous feedback. I don't care if you call those, you know, performance evaluations, real-time feedback, but the reality is that, that people know how to connect deeply with one another, and they're helping to coach one another to higher levels of performance. So when we have open loops of continuous feedback, we have self-coaching organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see the greatest levels of collaboration, the greatest levels of innovation, the greatest levels of performance is when individuals sharpen each other. Right. You know, and when you sharpen each other, sparks fly, but good things happen because we become sharper in our endeavors and we stay on the cutting edge. And so I think feedback is the key. Yeah, and you uh, and I see in 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 the book you talk a lot uh, about mastering the art of giving and receiving helpful feedback, and and it is an art, right? Because it's not always something that comes naturally to everyone. I mean, we don't innately we're not often innately good at we're certainly not innately good at receiving feedback. We're we're pretty good often at giving it, but maybe not always giving it in the right way. So, how do you master that art, and what is that art? Well, we spend a great deal of time. We actually have a, a, a whole chapter dedicated to the art of raw conversations. Mm -hmm. And to your point, uh, we often give feedback. And I, I ask leaders all the time, how often do you give feedback to your direct reports? And they answer the question. They say, how often do you ask your direct reports to evaluate your performance? <laughs> And all of a sudden, everybody you know, stops and they swallow hard because most of them never have asked for feedback. But if we want to grow, we have to know what other people around us see in us because we all have blind spots. Mm -hmm. So many of your listeners are probably very, very familiar with the 360 degree feedback, right? Yep. We garner feedback from everyone around you, above you, below you, beside you. Well, I have a... a, a uh, a more cost effective and simpler means of getting feedback. And it's what I call the poor man's 360. So I'll go ahead and throw it out to you. It's a single question that if you ask those around you will provide you with immense fodder for personal development. And it goes like this. If you were someone that I 
I really admired, respected, and trusted. We were in a deep relationship. I'd ask you, John, i say, John, what is it like for you to be on the other side of me? Mm-hmm. In other words, how do you perceive me? How do you see me? Uh, what kind of a wake do I leave in your world? And it's amazing. That simple question can provide for you, whether it's your spouse or your children or a colleague, can provide an immense amount of feedback for your personal growth and development. Wow, yeah, that's a that's an amazing question, and um, you know, obviously one that, yeah, that that requires a lot of reflection, right? And 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 that's the part, I guess, that is is difficult nowadays. We live in such a, a an instant world of distraction. Reflection is something that is almost like it's old fashioned now. Um, but no. to achieve what you're talking about, you have to have an element of reflection, right? Well, I think there, there are four components that are necessary for growth and maturity. And the very first one is you have to know yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and here's the reality. We, we all suffer from self-delusion. We, we have this way that we want to see ourselves and there's this way we want to promote ourselves. But it may not necessarily be the way that others experience us. And so we, in order to know ourselves, we have to, to do things like take assessments that give us insight beyond our own self-awareness mm-hmm. uh, and asking questions of those around us to give us feedback. So we have to, to know ourselves first, then we have to choose ourselves, we have to create ourselves, and then last, we have to give ourselves if we want to move toward maturity. Yeah, that, that, that's fascinating because I think sometimes uh, it, it's difficult for people to get to know themselves because maybe once you start to get you know you get to know yourself, maybe you don't like what you find or, or that's not who you always thought you were. So that's, uh, but but if you if you go through that process, um, you know, in, in your in your experience and your research, if you can go through that process, what does that really open up for you? Well, I think authenticity. Mm-hmm. And the ability to to um, accept yourself the way that you are. Authenticity means you, you understand your strengths and you've embraced those. But you understand your weaknesses and your shortcomings and you embrace those as well. Because if I don't embrace where I'm not strong, I can't gather resources and surround myself with other people who are strong in those areas as long as I pretend to be strong. Right. So I can help fill those gaps and build a strong team if I'm very comfortable. Here's how I say it. We have to first become comfortable in our own skin, no matter how freckled with failure it may be. Mm -hmm. And so failure is a part of our lives. It's a part of the reality of our existence. We learn from our failures. We have to be able to acknowledge our failures and our, our shortcomings, those areas that we need help from others, because then we can lean into others and draw from the strength that they possess. So authenticity is the first part. And then transparency, and that's what you're talking about, the willingness, the willingness to connect with others and let them see us for who we really are. But authenticity and transparency are the prerequisites to developing trust. Yeah. And what I like about what you're saying here is getting back to the idea of relationships. And, you know, there's nothing more relationship building is there than if I say to you, um, Randy, if you and I work together and I say to you, yeah, well, Randy, here's something I know you're really good at, but I'm not I'm not really good at this. And I really want us to work together. And I want you to help me and I want you to take this part of it because this is what you're really good at. I mean, that's a that that's a great relationship building exercise, isn't it? Because I'm acknowledge and number one, I'm acknowledging something I'm not good at, but I'm also complimenting you on your strength. Well, is, it, is that not necess, uh, necessary in order for there to be high levels of collaboration? Yep. Until we get to that point, we can't get the right people in the right seats on the bus mm-hmm. because we don't know who fits best in what role. And so that's the beginning, really, of collaboration, creativity, innovation. Until we have transparency and high levels of trust, we can't get to the rest. Yeah. And maybe even in that, if we have those high levels of trust, maybe you say back to me, actually, John, you're not that great at that thing that you think you're great at. You're much better at this. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the self coaching that we were talking about because I think there there are four different kinds of coaching and uh, there's the coaching that's uh, complimentary it affirms us and who we are right but then there are also coaching conversations that I call curious mm-hmm. meaning I sense something but I'm not sure so I'm gonna say hey John I- I'm just curious about this can you fill me in fill in the blanks give me some more details here that's a coaching conversation as well but then there's also a concern. Hey, John, I'm concerned about this. We need to address this. But then there's also correctional. And the correctional conversations are hard. 
because it means we have to deliver difficult content or we have to be willing to receive difficult content. And that's where the chapter on raw conversations comes in. But here's what's interesting. If we were more comfortable having the curious conversations and the concerned conversations, we'd have to have far less of the corrective conversations. Mm -hmm. And so the coaching element is absolutely vital to any healthy relationship. Because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a rule of um, communication is that uh, um, people will always believe conclusions they come to themselves far and away above anything you or I can say to them, right? So what you're talking about there through these curious conversations or discovery conversations is that you're providing the opportunity for the other person to come to some conclusions themselves with and then hopefully as you say then you don't actually have, have to point it out to them well i think the the lost art of good leadership is in asking good questions because when you ask good questions two things happen you allow that person to take ownership of the thought process which allows them also to take responsibility for the results but it also as a leader gives you keen insight to see into their thought process to understand how are they going to manage this? What are they thinking? Uh, as leaders, we think that we have to have the answers, right? Mm -hmm. And we feel good when someone comes to us because we're the subject matter expert and we're able to deliver the answer. But that doesn't do anything to empower our people or to help them in the growth process. Uh, matter of fact, one of the biggest mistakes I think a lot of people make is thinking that delegation is to get more things done, mm -hmm. which is absolutely erroneous. Delegation is designed to grow your people. So rather than going back to the same people over and over and over and over again that you know you can trust and they're going to deliver, you need to be going to people that you're not quite sure and they're not even quite sure whether or not they can deliver, but it's a growth opportunity they need. So we need to delegate in order to grow our bench strength. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like that. And I also think, a great, just to your point, I think one of the most powerful uh, things you can say, and, and, you know, I've certainly found this, and it's a great, uh, you know, trust builder, is to be able to, when somebody asks you, just to say, I don't know. That's I don't, right. I actually, I don't know. Now, and then follow up with a question. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Yep. Rather than, as you said, like feeling that you have to come up with some answer just because maybe you're in a leadership position. So, but I tell you, I've always found it when you say that, I don't know, what do you think? Or do you know, do you know, or does anybody else know? I mean, that, that builds that, uh, builds that collaboration. Um, so just, um, just rounding this out. So trust, uh, you know, this, this all revolves around trust, as you said, you know, looking the best for yourself, the best, you know, from, from um from others etc is that it to build that 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 takes that takes a particular commitment on behalf of leadership to build that kind of trust environment right right absolutely it's it's interesting john because i think when people are thinking through whether or not they're going to follow us th there are three questions that they ask and and the first is can i trust this person mm -hmm. Because they want to know when push comes to shove, are you going to throw me under the bus? Are you going to do what's right? Um, you know, can I trust you? Are you a person of integrity? Are you consistent throughout? And so that's foundational. The second question they ask is, is this person competent? Can I depend upon them? Do they have the knowledge and the skill sets to be able to deliver on the promises that they make? And then the third question they ask is, does this person have my best interest at heart? Now, at the base of all that is trust, because yep. if I don't believe that you have my best interest at heart, then I'm going to question everything you ask me to do. Is this just because you want me to do something for you to advance your career? Mm -hmm. you know, or is this truly seeking to help me grow and find a solution that will help me prepare for the future? And so those three questions, I think, are absolutely paramount. Leaders need to know, although people aren't aren't asking those you know, overtly, yep. subconsciously, that's what they're processing when they try to determine whether or not they're going to follow us and, for that matter, whether or not they're going to buy from us. Yeah, true. And if you get back to what you originally said, that's where we have to be very aware of what we're communicating and how we right. communicate it both verbally, non-verbally and whatever. Because if we're not, if if I'm saying to you, 
yeah, Randy, yeah, you know, I've, I've got great faith in you and you're going to do really well here, but really underlying it all, you can, it all sounds a bit fake and then my actions don't back it up, then the words are meaningless. Absolutely. Yeah. That's absolutely spot on. So, Randy, uh, as we finish up here, I uh, just want to give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about yourself, your organization, how they can learn more about you. And and obviously, um, your book is coming out on February 5th. I, I encourage everybody to check it out and uh, and pre-order. Uh, uh, and it's got, I see, uh, Ken Blanchard doing the forward. So that's uh, always a good endorsement there. Yeah, and Ken lives in your area. He's he not does. too far from you, so he's in I won't, I won't tell where he is because he may not want everybody knowing, but he, <laughs> yeah, I know where he is. <laughs> as well. But uh, yeah, Ken is a friend and he's been a, a great uh, inspiration to me, a coach and a mentor. And we were delighted to have him write the forward to the book. But if people are interested in getting in touch, they can always go to drrandyross.com and learn more about what we do. If they're interested in having me come as a speaker or if they want to get access to other resources that we have available. We are a, a concierge consulting and advisory group. Uh, we have the privilege of working with organizations locally, but also organizations globally. And um, it, we help organizations refine their culture and strengthen their leadership. Great. Well, I look forward to the book, Randy, and I'm sure it's going to be a great success. And thank you for joining us today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. <laughs>